I, I want to thank Sheila and Jane very much um, for giving me the opportunity to lecture today. Um, speaking to an academic <clears throat> audience in the UK is a very welcome uh, experience for me. And this is because I think your society is not as obsessed and divided over the issue of abortion as mine. I, it's my, I believe that people here may hold different personal views on the subject, but politically, and it would seem socially as well, in contrast to the U U.S., the matter has been settled. Um, in the U.S., we have a constant, um, a constant tumult. Some argue that the causes of this is be cause of this is because our in in our country, my country, abortion's legality was decided by our Supreme Court and not our Parliament, and therefore the resolution here has greater democratic legitimacy. Others argue that the textual basis of the decision in Roe v. Wade in the U.S. was a stretch. Would the framers of the U.S. Constitution not roll over in their graves if they knew that privacy? itself not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, now includes right to abortion. But these are critiques of Roe, and I am for the most part quite fine with the decision and proceed in this lecture with abortion's legality firmly in place. I am interested, however, in the many ways in which abortion fervor in the United States is kept feverish. Some of these ways are cultural, um, such as the affection towards the fetus that many Americans uh, feel or say they feel. And much of this affection was brought about through the social practices surrounding sonograms, something I've written about uh, earlier. And I think most everyone I know has been handed uh, um, and then fawned over a picture of someone's indecipherable sonogram in a moment of celebratory sharing. Um, but because I'm a lawyer and not a cultural historian, my interest is in the relation of law to these different phenomena. Thus, I've written about mandatory ultrasound statutes, statutes in several American states that require pregnant women to have an a sonogram and be asked if they want to look at the picture of their, by statute, unborn child uh, before they may legally consent to an abortion. These statutes show how conservative small c lawmakers in the U.S. have brilliantly harnessed the social meaning of fetal imagery and put it to legal use. Today I want to talk about a different aspect of the problem of abortion in the U.S. And I, I hope that some of it will be relevant to themes here as, as well. Um, th these are the practices of concealment and non-disclosure that regularly accompany having an abortion. As with sonograms, this too requires understanding phenomena that are not entirely legal in nature. Um, and as with sonograms, I've been thinking about the law's involvement. So to introduce how this works, I want to start with the 1973 case in Roe v. Wade. Um, and I think you are all familiar with the case. It's the one that legalized abortion in the United States and said that Texas or no other state could criminalize abortion, no longer criminalize abortion. And I want to go um, no further than the title of the case. Um, Wade was the prosecutor, Henry Wade, who was responsible for enforcing Texas's criminal abortion statute. But a quick note, footnote following the court's first mention of the plaintiff, Jane Rowe, informs us only that, quote, the name is a pseudonym. Um, this raises an interesting and little discussed aspect of the famous case. When can a party to litigation not use his or her own name, but sue under a fictitious one? Um, a basic requirement of our adversarial system, which we got from you, um, is that a complaint must name the parties, all of the parties. Not only does the defendant have the right to know who, is, um, who has sued him, but the press has a right to report on it. As our Supreme Court explained, what transpires in the courtroom is public property. The people have a right to know who is using their courts. So what are we supposed to make then of Jane Roe? How does it come about that a party may appear in court under an alias? What characteristics of the plaintiff or the case so overwhelm the presumption of disclosure that, um, she, that she can manage to do this? And um, so here, um, courts have answered the question this way. The common thread is that, I'm quoting, the common thread is that the presence of some social stigma or the threat of physical harm uh, if the plaintiff's identity becomes part of the public record. So under those circumstances, you can come in under an alias. And suits involving abortion are among, one of, among the few exceptions where court permit, 
parties to proceed anonymously. The others, just so you'll begin to get a feel for this, are mental illness, homosexuality, transsexuality, HIV status, and abandoned children in welfare cases. So that's the group we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> But even outside a public courtroom, the practice of keeping one's name distance from the of abortion is, is uh, common as a matter of everyday life. That's to say that women in the US don't talk much about abortion as a personal experience. They don't tell their friends, except maybe a very good one who will drop them off or pick them up afterwards. They don't always tell their husbands or partners. Um, young women don't always tell their parents, and mothers rarely tell their children. Even in so-called pro-choice families, the news can be unexpected and unsettling. One young woman described after how her middle-aged mother confided in her that she had had an illegal abortion while a college student in 1972, quote, it took a few years for the shock to wear off. The daughter had never thought that a right to abortion was, uh, the daughter had thought that a right to abortion was something that, quote, only other women needed, not my family and certainly not my mother. Um, now, many, uh, Women don't tell their insurance companies in the U.S. We don't have an NHS, um, even when their policies cover abortion. Uh, many pay out of pocket to prevent their records from being um, computerized to keep their medical records uh, private. Women with family doctors don't always tell them, but travel far away to places far away uh, to find a physician who doesn't know them. Not always sure about their own doctor's view on abortion, some are hesitant to jeopardize the relationship. I'm quoting from, even if he never showed any sign of disapproval, I would from that day on be a lot more leery about how I was around him and things I would say. Even waiting rooms in abortion clinics are fraught. A teacher in, a high school teacher in Little Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas explained, it makes me nervous even being in the waiting room. You don't want to know who's here, you don't want to be recognized, and you don't want to see them ever again. Um, there, is, there are, of course, exceptions, and I'm going to read one which I found in an article called Safe to Talk, Abortion Narratives as a Right of Return. And I just love this. It says, one woman told people on a, quote, need-to-know basis. Here I go. My lover who impregnated me, the man I lived with and later married, a friend who loaned me money for the procedure, women who helped me locate a clinic, and finally, in an only-on-the-left moment, the entire steering committee of a strike I was involved in during the course of the argument about who should get arrested, I couldn't risk civil disobedience and thus miss the clinic appointment. So <laughs> one of those only on the left moments. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and while I'll be talking mostly about women, I want to say that abortion providers, doctors, nurses, um, uh, uh, guards, receptionists, counselors, often only wear first name only tags and don't always tell their families what they do or where they work. Now, these many forms of concealment, and there are more to come, are what, examples of what I'm calling abortion secrecy. The term secrecy seems a fair description of the deliberate non-disclosure that, that regularly accompanies planning or having an abortion, and that explains the often furtive behavior that marks the experience in the U.S. as something that is best hidden. There is, of course, another way to describe all this. One might say, instead, that women choose to keep their abortion intentions or histories under wraps, not because these matters are secret, but because they are private. By private, I mean simply that certain information, usually personal, usually important, falls within a zone of control that, as a cultural practice or sometimes as a matter of law, is the person's alone to reveal, not because it must be hidden, but because it's nobody else's business. In this lecture, I want to explore the difference between privacy and secrecy in the context of abortion as a way of, coming, of trying to get closer to understanding why, as a general matter, women are hesitant to talk about the subject and eager to distance themselves from it. I'm going to build the case that secrecy rather than privacy is the more accurate characterization and that the distinction between the two matters crucially in how women experience the decision, the procedure, and its aftermath. So a quick word about what is at stake. Um, my primary interest is in how women fare, what it, uh, and, 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 um, but, and I would later argue in, in another chapter that the burden of keeping a secret and its unbidden disclosure are both sources of harm for women. But Secrecy at the level of individual experience has what I'm going to call an important trickle-up effect. 
To the extent that women feel unable to talk quietly but openly about the particulars of an abortion, perhaps how they got pregnant, the nature of their deliberations, how they negotiated the logistics, the transportation, the childcare, the fees, the law. Under those circumstances, the quality of public discussion about abortion is also compromised. This in turn, I'm arguing, makes informed political deliberation about abortion less likely. So this is the trickle-up effect from private conversation to more public conversation to political deliberation. Um, so what I'm interested in is the connections between private discussions and public discourse, and between public discourse and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and, and, and political talk. Uh, my argument is pretty simple. It's that the absence of private discussion distorts the nature of public debate, and this in turn disfigures the legislative process. Now, my claims about the upward progression from private to public to political rest on three assumptions. The first is that legislators want to have a sound factual basis for deciding how something should be regulated. Um, second, my claim takes for granted that what women have to say about abortion, recognizing that all women do not say the same things, provides the best factual basis for the, what the experience of abortion is like. Um, this is a familiar point, certainly within feminist communities, which have long accepted women's accounts of something um, as a touchstone of authenticity. Um, the point is not limited to feminists. In considering whether it is possible to regard the death of a fetus in early pregnancies as the same as the death of a born child, philosopher Bernard Williams wrote that, in the end, this issue can only come back to the experience of women. This is not because their experience, I'm quoting Williams, this is not because their experiences are the only thing that counts. It is because their experiences are the only realistic and honest guide we have to what the unique phenomenon of abortion genuinely is, as opposed to what moralists, philosophers, and legislatures say it is. It follows that their experience is the only realistic guide to what the deepest consequences will be of our social attitudes towards abortion. So without this honest guide, facts that one might want to know rather than to surmise or imagine are missing. And this is a matter of great concern because the information considered by legislatures in the U.S. Uh, has of late seemed alarmingly p partial. Um, consider the testimony of some 2,000 women collected by the South Dakota Task Force on Abortion. This was a task force charged by the South Dakota legislature to study such matters as the health risks that undergoing abortion has on women, including the delayed onset of cancer, and whether abortion is a workable method for the pregnant woman to waive her rights to a relationship with the child. Not surprisingly, the women testified almost to a person about the overwhelming trauma and grief abortion had on, has had on their lives. 99% of them strongly believed as a result of their experiences abortion should be illegal. Now these figures are important. Following feminist methodology, they claim to take women's experiences seriously. Yet the pervasive secrecy around abortion makes it difficult to evaluate the task force's numbers against or alongside the testimony of women for whom legal abortion was not traumatic and who, one imagines, were well pleased that the procedure was legal. Um, the final assumption about the relation between private conversation and more public or political ones is that there is a trickle-up effect. For my claim about the movement of information must be something more than a hunch or a grown-up version of Chinese whispers. Just exactly how does taking an issue, talking about an issue among family friends, family friends or close friends, uh, open the way for wider consideration of an issue, particularly the tricky issue of abortion? Um, the answer requires identifying the mechanisms, the processes or structures of transmission that explain this migration once secret information moves into more public realms. And I'll conclude my talk by looking at some of those mechanisms. Right now I'm getting ahead of the story, and the question here is simply to consider whether women's reluctance to talk about abortion is best characterized as privacy or secrecy. Um, okay, so let's just, I'm getting very nervous already with the time. <laughs> okay, so um, let's turn to abortion privacy. Uh, I am using the word privacy in uh, a slightly different sense than it's often associated with abortion, as in the right to abortion. 
Um, that was what the Supreme Court decided in Roe v. Wade, that there was a constitutional right to abortion. It was a form of privacy that respects the personal autonomy embodied in the right to make one's own decision about important matters. And it applies this kind of privacy to other, other uh, personal decisions as well. But it is, it is generally known as decisional privacy. It's the right of privacy that lets you make the decision. There is another dimension to privacy, though, and this is that, and Roe said nothing about this at all, which was about a woman's right to control publicity around the decision once it was made. And this is called informational privacy, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. I think you can see that decisional privacy and informational privacy protect different interests. One is the right to make the decision. The second is the right to keep the decision to yourself. And it's... Um, it's clear to see how, the, how one would influence, uh, how informational privacy would affect the way you make a decision. Um, a woman who knows that her intentions to have an abortion will become public might be concerned about attempts by those who find out about it to prevent her from acting on it, um, whether through physical or emotional force or threat. This is why in, in the U.S. the Supreme Court has said states may not condition a woman's um, right to have an abortion on getting her husband's consent or on no, even notifying him. Um, both of those were ruled out. Um, but the relationship between decisional and informational privacy goes beyond sort of brute pressure or prevention that might literally block a woman's access. And I have in mind the possibility of disclosure, um, which, which relates uh, uh, to the stigma attached to having it be known that you're having an abortion. And as um, one of our justices observed in a case involving pregnant minors, it is inherent in the right to make the abortion decision that the right be exercised without public scrutiny, because without privacy, one's choice is effectively made by others. So decisions about abortion are complicated by women's awareness of the possibility of exposure by one means or another. In a 2004 decision quashing our, um, a government subpoena seeking patient abortion records, a federal court described the situation this way. American history discloses that the abortion decision is one of the most controversial decisions in modern life. It is uh, with a probium ready to be visited upon the woman who so decides and the doctor who engages in the medical procedure. Um, and the public is also more sophisticated in finding out confidential things. In refusing to order even redacted medical records of late-term abortion patients to be turned over to the state, uh, Judge Richard Posner took note of the technological advances of snooping, stating that, quote, skillful Googlers might well be able to sift the information contained in the medical records concerning each, pa each patient's medical and sex history, put two and two together, and out the women, thereby exposing them to threats, humiliation, and obloquy. Um, uh, moreover, the threat of disclosure is not time-limited, but can lurk over an entire life. Um, in the U.S., questions about a woman's past abortions um, have turned up in connection with all sorts of things, employment applications, political campaigns, custody fights. Um, thus, abortion, is not simply a ma abortion disclosure is not simply a matter of enduring momentary opprobrium, but it augurs a more protracted threat. And that is some of what is at stake with abortion privacy. So what do we mean by privacy? Um, privacy scholar Alan Weston defined it as the claim of an individual to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them will be provided to others. This is a good start, but what is it about this particular information, as opposed to all other things we might like to keep private, that privilege it as a matter of privacy. Certainly not everything a person might keep to themselves, might prefer to keep to themselves when age, true hair color, criminal or marital record is regarded as private so that norms of uh, non-intrusion attach. So there's a general consensus across disciplines that for information to be recognized as private, it must in the first instance be very personal and also very important. Um, one measure of privacy taken from tort law is whether the disclosure is such that a reasonable person would feel justified in feeling highly aggrieved by it. Um, thus, the courts... Okay, so, but, uh, but there are certain exceptions. Um, the, 
And one of them is that the information must be of, quote, no legitimate concern to the public. So in a Michigan case, Doe v. Mills, anti-abortion protesters argued that because abortion was an issue, abortion itself mm. was an issue of legitimate concern to the public, two Doe plaintiffs had no protected privacy interest in their actual names being displayed on large signs held up for public view as the plaintiffs arrived at an abortion clinic. In that case, the protesters had obtained clinic appointment records from a dumpster. What do you call it? A bin? Yeah, yeah? a waste bin. A waste bin. Um, and the, the trial court said, yes, abortion is um, so controversial that it is a matter of great public concern. Happily, the appellate court said they could distinguish between abortion as a issue of public, con uh, public concern generally, but that that did not require the identity of particular patients. Um, uh, there have been other examples. Uh, public records are another exception, so that if something is in the public record, it is not confidential. And this has created some other problems. Um, in some states, driver's licenses have been considered public records. Anyone can go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and through a license plate track the owner of the car. Certain um, anti-abortion groups have done just that with patients who park their cars at abortion clinics or doctor's offices. In one case, a woman visited a clinic only to find black balloons and anti-abortion literature on her doorstep. Another woman um, received a venomous letter discussing, quote, the guilt of having one's own child killed and God's curse for the shedding of innocent blood. This led to the passage of it by our Congress of something called the Driver's Privacy Protection Act so that the public, this was a limitation on the public records of driver's licenses being able to provide that information. Um, in addition to information in public records, uh, claims to privacy are also compromised when someone has made the information publicly available themselves, like a posting on a, a social media page. Um, there's also no claim to privacy if something occurs in physical, pub physical space, public space. Um, the idea is, as you know from torts probably, that uh, you can have no expectation of privacy when anyone on the street could see you with their own eyes. This is a difficult problem because you have to walk on a street to get to an abortion clinic. Um, you, it, you, there's no way to go there other than on public space. And um, uh, it, there also seems to be a U.S. version of postcode lottery. Um, in a, one case from California, a city in Chico, um, the health center, the abortion clinic health center, sought to bar protesters standing at the entrance of its parking lot. Chico was so small they answered that the protesters would be likely to identify the patients as they entered. But the court held for the protesters, noting that plaintiffs, quote, having chosen to live in the environments of a small city, cannot expect the courts to guarantee them the kind of anonymity they might find in a large metropolitan community such as New York City. Interesting. Um, so that what counts as public privacy, well, your expectations of privacy may differ according to where you live. Um, we also have to take seriously the vaguely voluntary relinquishments that have become part of our contractual relations with internet providers, retailers, and credit card companies. I put aside for now the massive involuntarily data collected by the National Security Agency, and here the G. Thank you. Yes. Um, for example, Target, which is a large uh, sells everything store in the U.S., um, now uses something called um, predictive analyses to decide what their buyers um, would like to buy. And this led to a headline in, 19, in 2012 called How Target Figured Out a Girl Was Pregnant Before Her Father Did. Um, they had, <laughs> using predictive analyses, they had reviewed her purchases and made the assessment she was probably pregnant, uh, just so you'll know. The things that they can tell, are you probably pregnant? Home pregnancy tests, scent-free items, and certain vitamins are three of the 25 data points used to detect for pregnancy. Target then sent coupons for diapers and cribs to her home address to the fury and puzzlement of her father. Sadly, she was pregnant. Um, they, they, had, they had it right, but that's not the point. Okay, 
And certainly the metadata collected by the NSA and other security agencies could be mined for abortion-related data. And when there was testimony before the European Parliament on the on um, what did it mean to have all this information collected, um, one of the witnesses listed of many things that if you just call, if you just call for you know certain locations and so on, would identify um, um, uh, abortion clinics, drug counseling centers, you know the things the things you would like to keep, probably like to keep private. Um, so, but even in the face of these quasi-consensual and non-consensual forms of surveillance, there's still an idea of the right to be left alone. Um, now, I realize many people don't want to be left alone. As a culture, and I think I am speaking here of the U.S., we have become hugely confessional and massively indiscreet. Um, and so even amidst these public, often unbidden outpourings, not, but not everything has become the stuff of primetime television. And um, I'm suggesting that abortion is one of them uh, that people prefer to keep private. Now, why is privacy valued? So in her study of um, privacy in 18th century novels, um, Professor Patricia Spax notes that the concept of privacy protects what she calls an inner uncoerced realm or what has been called a private sphere of valuation. One develops one's own values from the repertoire offered up by society and then see, tries them on to see what fits. Um, and another, putting it another way, legal sociologist Kim Shepley observed that the ability to reveal or to hide information is, a crucial, is crucial to an individual's ability to shape the social world in her immediate vicinity. So there's something empowering, something self-defining about exercising privacy in this sense. It explains in Patricia Spax's phrase, privacy's, quote, self-evident desirability. But this is the very point on which I want to distinguish privacy from secrecy. If privacy embodies a self-evident desirability, I'm arguing that secrecy appears a more ominous proposition. It suggests that the matter it is best to keep the matter to yourself, not simply because all things considered you prefer to do so, but because of the apprehension that if you do not, harm will follow. In her book, Secrets, Cicela Bach discusses why revealing the secrets of others is morally wrong. She says, it's not only the secret contains matters legitimately considered private, but because the revelation will, quote, hurt the individual talked about. And my argument is that the pervasive silence around abortion a silence found even between intimates is often a matter of secrecy in just this way. It anticipates harm to individuals that um, the disclosure is understood to bring. Now, um, insisting on that there is a difference between abortion privacy and the abortion secrecy, I recognize that the two forms of concealment have things in common. And this may explain why they're often blurred in ordinary conversation. There's no suggestion of anything clandestine or furtive when the answer to the question, are you having a boy or a girl, is, it's our little secret. Um, and so, so, okay. And this, also, the practical results may be the same. If something is kept secret, it remains private. If it's kept private, it may also stay a secret, but not necessarily. As Cecil LeBach has noted, a private garden may not be a secret garden. The analogy is not perfect, but it's, the image is helpful in getting at this distinction. A truly private garden over which one has control doesn't need to be secret in order to afford the chosen seclusion that is privacy's benefit. No one enters a private garden without the owner's consent. Um, but while, um, I'm just going to skip a little bit here and go to, um, to, if that's the benefit of privacy, I want to say something about the harms of, um, uh, of secrecy. I think that secrecy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the decision to something, keep something secret for fear of harm has an element of duress about it. Um, and that that's the element that, 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 I'm, that I'm interested in. I'm not using duress in a completely or strictly legal sense of an unlawful threat that deprives a person of her free will but rather to suggest a set of social pressures that push the motivation for abortion non-disclosure from the preference for privacy into a perceived need for secrecy. Now, I'm not claiming that privacy is always good and secrecy is always bad. 
We know that in the not so distant past, privacy was used to shield practices of, fam of um, violence uh, from outside scrutiny. And we know that not all commitments to secrecy are motivated by fear. One may be obligated to keep information secret as a matter of private contract, trade secrets, or by statute, se state secrets, or professional ethics, client and pastoral secrets. Those are, and there are also voluntary secrecy pacts, which I'll skip over some interesting examples of. Um, but why does it matter whether we say something is secret or private? Um, I, I'm contending that while individual cases will certainly differ from one another, in the context of abortion, the concealment tends to align more with secrecy than with privacy, and that abortion secrecy is much darker, more psychologically taxing, and more socially corrosive. Um, so why, why, do people, why, why is the felt need to keep abortion secret? Bach suggests that secrecy acts, operates as an added shield in case the protection of privacy should fail. And in her study of Victorian family secret keeping, a fabulous book, um, historian Deborah Cohen describes secrecy as privacy's indispensable handmaiden. What occasions the need for shields and for handmaidens? The answer is the negative consequences, the perceived disaster produced by revelation. Enlisting the sorts of secrets that Victorians kept secret, illegitimate birth, a son with a propensity for unnatural crimes, suicide, insanity, adultery, bankruptcy, Cohen notes that the exposure of any of these was catastrophic, subjecting the family to legal disability and to social scorn. Now the subject of these 19th century secrets may now seem quaint or unnecessary to us, but only just. Um, Consider, consider by analogy a decision to acknowledge one's sexual orientation at a time when homosexuality, to use the best language of the period, was grounds for dismissal from work, losing custody of one's child, or arrest on morals charges. These were all lawful responses. It isn't hard to see why, when being openly gay was regarded as illegal, immoral, and disgusting, and with the advent of HIV and AIDS as being murderous, that a closet, preferably a locked one, was a safer place. But locating closets within the domain of privacy doesn't quite capture the nat nature of closetedness, a form of concealment that is quite debilitating as the fear of exposure looms over daily life. And I want to suggest that the same phenomenon now plays out in many places with abortion. Even though abortion is no longer a crime, like homosexuality is no longer a crime, an aura of wrongdoing still attaches. Some of it draws from the language of criminality. Abortion providers in the US are not called doctors or physicians, but abortionists. Um, and the word provider is used to avoid the connotation of being an abortion uh, doctor. Some of the taint also draws from the general practices of deception that around, surround abortion. For many women, it involves lying about where they're going and what they're doing and subterfuge, um, off organizing days and nights away from home when one is up against a mandated waiting period and the nearest clinic is hundreds of miles away. I live in a very big country and something like 87% of counties don't have uh, any abortion providers. Now I have to say, a lot of those counties don't have anything except some tumbleweed and, and you know, a cactus here or there, but nonetheless, you see the picture that unless you're in a sort of, um, depending on what state you're in, and Mississippi has proudly announced it is now an abortion-free state um, because they've gotten rid of all the clinics. So, um, but back to what I'm saying, there's also um, an overlay of sneakiness. Why would anybody go into court using an alias? Um, and uh, why, how, what exactly are they, what are they, why is this necessary? I think for some, the idea is that they're sneaking around the very wages of sin by being able to ha have an abortion. Um, there's also a character logical dimension at work. Um, information about a prior abortion is taken as proof of bad character with implications about other aspects of a woman's life. Um, just to name one case, a case where a plaintiff brought a malpractice action against doc uh, the hospital because her infant, her newborn son, had died at the hospital due to negligence. Um, at the trial, the hospital introduced evidence showing that Mrs. Garcia had had three abortions prior to the birth of her son. Um, at th their claim was, uh, 
uh, their claim was that, quote, if a woman has voluntarily consented to an abortion, she is less affected by the pain of the loss of a child than a woman who never voluntarily terminated a pregnancy. Um, happily, the appellate court declined to accept this ruling and ordered a new trial. But as an abortion court stated in 1919, um, such evidence serves only to debase and degrade the defendant and to inflame and prejudice the minds of the jury against her. I found an, a, quite a trove of criminal law cases where a woman's prior abortion is brought in to show her character and why it is more likely than not that she committed a particular crime. Sometimes the evidence is permitted, sometimes not. Um, but one thing to think about is that even if it's later thrown out on appeal, one is still exposed during the process. So the actual legal rule that one cannot admit such evidence may be less important than the fact of exposure. Um, okay, I'm going to, um, oh no I'm not, I'm going to skip, yeah? Okay, I'm going to keep going then. So I want to make an analogy um, because there are some problems with secret keeping. And one of them is that uh, the secrets, the secret may, uh, the law may change and the secret be exposed. And let me tell you the example I'm thinking of. It's, um, it is um, the example of birth mothers who in decades past surrendered their newborns for adoption, secure that as a matter of state law, their secret was safe. And I don't have a firm handle on abortion, uh, pardon me, adoption uh, law in the UK, but I think it follows a similar thing. I also forgot, I meant to apologize at the beginning, I can't help saying privacy. And I know it must grate on your ears, but I, no, okay. Okay, maybe only in Oxford they say privacy only, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I tried it and I couldn't do it, so my apologies. Um, so uh, if for the longest time, the scheme of adoption was uh, sealed and closed adoptions. You gave up a baby for adoption, um, you didn't know who the adoptive parents would be, the record was sealed, uh, put away, a new birth certificate was issued in the name of the, for the child with the adoptive parents put in instead of the birth parents. Um, in the early, in, in, throughout the 1980s, this began to change for a number of reasons. Birth mothers began to sort of come out and organize. Um, also with the advent of abortion, there were fewer babies available to be adopted, so birth mothers got a little more political power. And, in order, and adoption agencies would said, you know, birth mothers, what do you want? What did it take t for you to give your babies? And they said, oh, we'd like a little more control over it. We'd like to know where our child goes and maybe even who the parents are. So it was a shift from closed adoption to what is called open adoption. And mo every, every, all agencies now, except some Mormon agencies, offer open adoption. Um, this was good news for some birth mothers and disastrous news for others. In a 1989 case from Oregon called Doe's 1 through 7, seven women who put their babies up for adoption over a period of 30 years, so some were now in their late 70s, uh, it, it, Oregon had just passed a law saying that an adult adoptee was entitled to unseal their, abortion, their, their adoption record. So these women said, we proceeded with our lives on the, relying on the state law that said our identities would be secret. We've moved on, we've had other children, we have husbands, we don't want that part of our life dredged up. And the court said, um, we're very sorry, but you were never promised total confidentiality and we have to balance your needs with the needs of adult adoptees, adult adoptees in the facts of their own, in their, in their right to find their own biological parents, something some of us were talking about uh, earlier. Now, I've lingered on this case because it's useful to compare the, no the nature of the Doe's predicament alongside the predicament of others with secrets to keep. And I think three aspects are particularly important. First, the Doe's initial decision to insist on secrecy was not some sort of feminine delicacy or social skittishness. It was a considered response to contemporary social values and their manifestation in law. During the decades in which they surrendered their infants, the stigma around unwed motherhood and premarital sex was real and stinging. Um, uh, one case describes uh, uh, the, their situation as a life-wrecking disaster. Um, bastards, as they were then called, were entitled to no uh, financial support from the state or from the natural father. 
Uh, so against all of this, closed adoption offered a way out and a way forward. Um, yet things change, and this is my second point. Um, over time, single motherhood began to look somewhat less scandalous, and the theories of child development that favored secrecy switched as ideas of, um, of uh, identity formation uh, began to edge them out. So, um, so, so that, that, that there was a social change in how people thought about unwed motherhood and the process of adoption. And this really leads to my third point, which is that law itself can be the source of both secrecy and disclosure. In the Oregon example, it was the law that um, authorized the disclosure of mother's identities just as the previous law had protected them. Now, these features map onto abortion in interesting ways. Um, and uh, as with adoption, the need for felt secrecy around abortion is similarly hinged to existing social judgments about abortion and the bundle of behaviors it is, reveals or is thought to reveal, um, the underlying sex, reproductive irresponsibility, parental disobedience, and murder. Um, so in both adoption and abortion, the law has operated to protect secrets um, uh, and, and to expose them. And we see this, that the law protects plaintiffs by hiding their identities under a doe alias. Um, but uh, I describe in the next chapter ways that the law also exposes, exposes women who've had abortions. Um, and I, there's not time to talk about that now. But now I come to a main point. Why do things change? That's what I figure out. We kind of have an idea of why the social background to adoption changed. But why do, what would it take to have attitudes towards abortion change so that it were not such a, the perceived need to keep it secret uh, where it's not so great and the perceived ha harm was actually, well, perceived harm, which is actually a real harm often, would be, would re be reduced. And my answer is that a starting point is the, is a kind of coming out by women um, and I don't mean this in an activist way, but in a very small and private way. Unlike the critiques of adoption that came out in the 1980s, newsletters, appeals to state houses, press releases, there is much less talking about abortion uh, at the ground roots level. So there isn't much for legislature, legislators or folks in general to go on. We have a lot of statistical information about abortion. Uh, one million abortions a year in the United States 18% are among teenagers, half are among women in their 20s. 61% um, are obtained by mothers who have one or more children, so it's a maternal issue. It is, uh, um, but although all this information is perfectly clear and not disputed, it has no texture, it has no narrative, it has no face. Any more intimate or personal representation is, uh, we're deprived of that by the unwillingness of women to speak up. So here we see the authority of abortion secrecy and the importance of understanding the processes by which the release of secrets takes place or doesn't take place. So my argument is we can't get to the trickle up, the trickle up process that I was talking about until we have some discussion at the quiet, private, intimate level. And certainly in the US that doesn't exist. Now, um, how, why would, am I right, I'm going back to one of my earlier questions, that there is a trickle-up effect. Why might there be a change in social attitudes if there were more discussion about abortion, about women's individual abortion experiences? And I don't mean going on television, or you know, I don't mean in the kind of vulgar self, in, 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 I don't know if you have these terrible programs that we do. You do? Yeah, okay. <laughs> So I don't mean like 16 and pregnant, or you know, I don't mean when we, those shows. I mean at a kind of, at the levels I was talking about earlier, being able to talk to your mother, being able to talk to your sister, just that it was acceptable within the family, that we weren't in a kind of Victorian secret keeping situation. Um, so one, so I have a few suggestions. Um, one is uh, a, few, a few methods by which this could happen. And one is called the contact hypothesis. There's a, a new book out by, well, it's not even out. It's an unpublished dissertation. So all of you who are working, hurry up and get your good work out there. Uh, or you'll have to be cited as an unpublished dissertation 
called Secrets and Social Influence by a sociologist um, named Sarah Cohen. And she connects a number of important dots. And very quickly, she says that secrets are selectively revealed. That when you have a secret because you think you're going to be harmed by its disclosure, you tend to tell people who you think will support you. You don't normally tell someone who's going to judge you and be, be, be um, uh, criticize you. So when you want to, to confide in someone, most people choose to confide in someone they trust. Um, now, that, and that empirical finding sort of makes intuitive sense. So she found out that far more women tell others about having a miscarriage, which is also highly kept secret, than having uh, an abortion. But what she says is that this is quite, and the contact theory is that when you have contact with someone who has a stigmatized characteristic, like having an abortion or what is a stick or being a smoker or you know whatever these days counts as a as a stigmatized characteristic um, that person tends to change their mind about the stigma that is when you meet an actual person who has the bad quality and you see that actually like it's your next door neighbor or your minister's wife or your professor or your daughter um, you, you people tend to rethink uh, whoa, this isn't what the way I thought that kind of person would be. And you may think about this with other stigmas uh, that you may have changed attitudes when you see, oh, disability is another one. Um, the problem is, if you only talk to people who are going to support you, the people who most need to hear it will never do it. So a strong anti-abortion advocate will... Uh, who's talking to someone who's had an abortion? Let's say his, let's say his secretary or his wife. I, you know, I don't know. Um, will not know that they're talking to somebody with the stigma, and so their attitudes will never change. So there won't be this effect of learning that people are not quite as you think they are by virtue of who people confide secrets in, and the fact that that's good, but it leaves out the people who might most. Um, rethink, possibly rethink their attitudes by knowing. Um, so that is, as Cohen, Cohen says, uh, abortion, Americans who have heard abortion secrets understand abortion differently than those who do not. Are we okay? Okay. What? Five minutes? Okay. Now, um, I don't think that women who've terminated a pregnancy think in terms of social influence theory or consider themselves political actors. Uh, for many, it was enough to end the pregnancy and just move on with regular life. Yet it may not be bad for these millions of women to consider themselves not necessarily as activists, but as women with the potential for influence on others. Um, now, there's not much of a movement like this afoot. And one of the reasons is that Many women who end their own pregnancies through abortion oppose the same decision when made by others. That is, there's very little solidarity among women who have abortions. In fact, when I've spoken on other topics with abortion, abortion doctors, providers have said to me, didn't I know that there were only three acceptable reasons for an abortion? And I fell for it the first time. You know, I said, well, no, I didn't. What are they? She said, rape, incest, and mine. <laughs> Which, which was very interesting. Um, but I do think that knowing that aborting women have at least the potential to change opinions of others by virtue of shaking free from the secret um, and being, without sound, wanting to sound too much like Bridget Jones, being exactly who they are is a positive thing to keep in mind. It's a very quiet sort of activism. Um, I, since there's so little time left, I will just tell you that the other, the, the, the other areas are open secrets. Um, it's very curious. Abortion is an open secret. That is, there are abortion clinics in the U.S. There are cars outside of them. There are people going in and out. Um, people know pe women are having abortions. It's just don't they think it's anybody they know. So it's a strange thing. It's both kept secret, and yet as a social phenomenon or practice, it's widely understood that it exists. And so part of what I think is interesting is to try to move it out of being, is to uh, have it be less of an open secret and more of a subject that's acceptable to talk about. Now, this may, 
um, sound like a burden on women who've had abortions. But there's a very interesting new website, it's a little bit new, in the U.S. called Exhale. Anybody heard of it? So Exhale is, a, is a, an anon, anonymous website, I mean, a website where, that you go on anonymously and you can just talk about how you feel about having had an abortion, whether you feel guilty, whether you feel relieved, whether you think God is punishing you, whether this was the best day of your life, you know, whatever it is, you can just talk, post anonymously. And I find that very interesting. It's kind of midway between secrecy and disclosure, that maybe people have to begin disclosing, disclosing anonymously, and then, and then it will become less fearsome, and that you'll see there are more people who have, 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 have done the same. Um, so that's, uh, the final thing is social movement theory. And um, that there's a whole, uh, uh, quickly say, in, in a book called, a book on cancer, uh, the author said, was telling about a woman who wanted to form a cancer support group in the 1950s. And she wrote to the New York Times because she wanted to place an ad. And she was um, sloughed off onto the uh, society editor and said she wanted to put this ad in about a breast cancer support group. And she was told, I'm sorry, Mrs. Rosenau, but the Times cannot publish the word breast or the word cancer in its pages. Very interesting. I then moved to May 14, 2012, where there was an op-ed piece by Angelina Jolie um, announced using both the word breast and the word cancer. And so what happened? Well, you can study the process of how something changed. We had a presidential wife named Betty Ford who had breast cancer. She announced it publicly. Um, there were, and, and, and some of the ads at the time said, don't die of embarrassment. And I think that matches up with one of the slogans from the 80s also, from the, um, uh, a when the AIDS epidemic, which was, I think you had it here too, silence equals death. And so the idea that, um, so, so that uh, the, the big question, I think I'll pretty almost end on this, is I've looked at a number of, of social movement theory with regard to depression, with regard to divorce, with regard to um, homosexuality. And in each of, and many cases, there's been progression, slow, but progression, so that, you know, there's now same-sex marriage. That couldn't have happened if the word, um, if, if, if there had, if the closet had stayed locked in that way. And so there is hope for social movement theory, although it's a very tough one with abortion. Abortion is one of the few things people still keep private, and I think that's because um, it involves the body, it involves sex, it's deliberate and voluntarily under undertaken as opposed to a miscarriage, and also it is thought to harm someone else. So many would argue it's not a victimless act. Um, okay, so to conclude, my claim is not that any of these any one of these mechanisms of social change, contact theory, social movement theory, the migration of family secrets, pushing harder on the paradox of open secrets, not any one of them will itself engender a more capacious view towards abortion um, as the subject of regulation. But I think two things. The first is that each works part of the street, and so each stands to make things somewhat better. Um, Second, each of these mechanisms is dependent on more open discussion about abortion as a regular practice in women's lives, and it is that conversation I want to bring about. Um, this lecture is not intended as a manifesto or action plan, but it is meant to reorient how we think about the meanings of concealment. Um, it is no good for women to feel empowered by exercising their privacy rights when secrecy is masquerading as privacy. So I will stop there. Thank you.